Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Brookhouse, and welcome back to the class play on Sumer Sports. We're almost a month out from the draft, which means each position group is being analyzed with closer lens. As it looks now, there's a pretty good chance that quarterbacks go at least one through three, if not one through four. And so before jumping into that, we want to ask ourselves, if there were no premium quarterbacks, who would top the big board? Tell me that answer that question. I have Tej Seth with me. How you doing, Tej? I'm doing great. You know, I think we're missing Ben Brown, who's uh, who's really busy doing a lot of other stuff right now. But I think, the, you know, the two of us can hold down the fort here, talk about some non-quarterbacks, uh, you know, and, and get the people uh, going with, with that type of stuff. For sure. And if you want to help us out, too, uh, be sure to follow, subscribe and ask questions in the chat if you are live or ask questions via Twitter. You can reach me and Tej both on Twitter after the show. So since 2019, only quarterbacks, wide receivers, tight ends, interior defensive linemen, edge rushers, and cornerbacks have been in the top five of the consensus big board as tracked by, by NFL mock draft database. So with that in mind, we're going to focus on those positions and hit the offensive line positions a little bit as well. So Tej, let's start with wide receivers. Do you have a wide receiver that you think could potentially be at the top of a big board if there were no premium quarterbacks? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that this is the wide receiver that is at the top of the big board. So, you know, you think about March Madness and putting a bunch of one seeds in the final four. Like, this is my version of that, putting out Marvin Harrison Jr. as the top player on the big board. And, you know, he is number one on the consensus big board. But you look at his, his production, highest yards per out run in this draft class. You look at his nearest neighbors in terms of EPA per snap and yards per run. You have C.D. Lamb and Devontae Smith and, you know, players that have gone on to have very productive NFL careers. I was looking at some data from our friends at StatsBomb, and he has 18.4 yards per completion, which is the second best in this draft class. So just like complete production across the board. So I have Marvin Harrison Jr. as my top big board player out of the wide receivers. So, Tej, we talked about quarterbacks likely going one, two, three, maybe even four. Obviously, a lot of people are saying four, five, six potentially could be all wide receivers. You have Marvin Harrison Jr. first. What do you think about the order of all those three guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, when you think about like the loser's curse and, you know, the papers that have been written on these topics, like, there is about a 44% chance that the wide receiver taken after Marvison Harrison Jr., assuming he's the, the first wide receiver taken, is has a goes off to have a better career than him. That's not saying that, you know, it, it's a guarantee or, or not a guarantee, but I think that when you play the probabilities and you look at draft curves, like that's just kind of the, the chance of that happening. And I think that all three of these receivers are pretty close together. Um, whereas the 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 difference between Marvin Harrison Jr. And Malik Neighbors and, and Roma Dunze is not that big, but that is the the order that I have it in where I go neighbor or uh, Harrison Jr. Neighbors and then Odunze after that. Yeah, I I actually disagree, but that's why I'm glad that we can debate <laughs> on today's class play show. I'm really big on Roma Dunze. Um, obviously, there were concerns about kind of his speed, top end speed breaking away. We did see him have a ton of contested catches this year. But I think he kind of assuaged some of those fears in the combine. Obviously, there's the difference between combine speed and play speed. But he did have an elite RAS score, RAS score, relative athletic score, uh, running a 40 of like 4.45, 20-yard split, 2.57. So I think he's kind of assuaged some of those fears. But the reason I like him is just, you know, you're looking at teams at 4, at 5, that have experienced quarterbacks, you know, you're the Justin Herberts of the world, the Kyler Murrays. And I think if you're pretty comfortable with your quarterback, you can kind of get into that sphere where, you know, you have a, a guy who's probably confident throwing into tight spaces and you want a guy who can make those catches in tight spaces. And so Roma Dunze had that great contested catch rate, obviously played with Michael Penix, who was one of the better, more pro-style quarterbacks uh, who, are, who is in the draft this year obviously doesn't have that ceiling that some of those other quarterbacks have. But I, I can really see a lot of the stuff that Adunze did translate to the pros based on kind of a scouting profile, his analytics profile. That being said, interestingly, as you said, he's, he's not consensus big board uh, number one like Marvin Harrison Jr. is. He's at six. I could actually see him dropping 
to a point where, you know, like maybe he goes in the, in the later mid first round, but still, as you said, kind of has that better career. Um, and an interesting question that this kind of leads us into another position group that was brought up by Benjamin Robinson from grinding the mocks um, posed towards us was, how do you kind of gauge that highest projection versus ceiling versus how he, he fits with the team? You know, the, the best example of this in recent years is Jamar Chase versus Penny Sewell. Jamar Chase obviously went to the Bengals. Um, they later invested in T. Higgins. Both of those players have been really, really good, and obviously they make a Super Bowl. The Lions go ahead and invest Pen in Penny Sewell, uh, who's just an animal at that tackle position, uh, more of a protector, uh, and, and, and they've, they've also seen great returns from that decision. What is your kind of view, given that there are multiple places in this draft where a team may have to make a decision like that? This is a great question from our, our friend, Benjamin Robinson, talking about, you know, the, the wide receiver offensive tackle debate and how I view it is I like to go wide receiver, especially when you have this, this high end draft capital, like top 16 pick, because I think that a singular wide receiver, especially if they hit their 75th percentile outcome or higher can do a lot more for your offense than a singular offensive tackle. I think offensive line as, a, as an entire group, because of you know the way they affect both the run and the pass game might as well have more impact than a wide receiver core. But I think that when you look at it from an individual player level perspective, that, that wide receiver, especially if you do end up getting a, a good to elite wide receiver can really change the complexion of your offense in a way that a good to elite offensive tackle can't to, to a certain extent. Yeah, and, and it's also interesting. I think this kind of breaks down to style. Um, you know, like, obviously, Jim Harbaugh is is a very power guy. Um, typically, typically would have great offensive linemen with this, some of those 49ers teams. And obviously, Michigan was a power football team for the most of the time that he's there. It'll be interesting to see how, you know, just the, uh, an approach uh, from a coaching position actually has a, an effect on this. I think that the wide receivers probably are a class above this year than, than kind of some of those tackle positions are, but obviously like Joe Alt is a, is a great player. Um, and, and so, so it'll be interesting to see if, if there's some movement after something like a pro day, I saw a great question in the chat of how a pro day may affect Marvin Harrison jr. I, I think Tej has done a great job of looking at like how some of these metrics uh, that come out of a pro day or out of the combine affect, you know, a draft stock where he's on the board, so forth and so on. So Tej, do you want to go a little bit into that? Yeah, no, this is a great question from beat gamer 99 as well. And I think it's, it's interesting because when you look at Marvin Harrison jr, again, like number one on the consensus big board, uh, you know, most big boards would have him as a, at least a top three prospect. Like I think testing from his point of view can only really hurt him. I assume that he's gotten some assurances from teams like, you know, maybe the Cardinals or the Patriots even where like, they're saying like, if, if you are in, you know, available and, and we're still in that draft pick, like we will select you. So I'm sure he has a pretty good idea of where he's going to go in the draft. And, and he's just, you know, using the time to actually get ready for his, his rookie season instead of spending time training for the particular events he would have to do at the combine combine or the pro day. Yeah, and that brings us kind of into kind of the flip side of the wide receiver, obviously on the defensive side, into uh, a position that this year probably wouldn't really get close to that number one consensus big board position, and that's the cornerback position. Obviously, a lot of these guys are more in the the you know middle teens in terms of where they are in the consensus big board, but the cornerback position historically has kind of jumped up into that top five consensus big board. There's guys like Derek Stingley. Um, who were very well regarded going into draft season. So we wanted to touch a little bit on how the cornerback position looks this year. Tej, who's someone that jumps out to you? Yeah, so I, I love Terion Arnold from Alabama. He's he, he would be uh, you know at the top of my corner list if I was a a corner needy team. And you know he's twelfth on the consensus big board. He's second behind the the guy you're about to talk about. But I, what I really like about Arnold is he can line up in the slot or out wide. He has experience doing both. So that's a very versatile defensive back you can add to your backfield. He only allowed four touchdown passes in his entire college career, but had six interceptions. So, you know, he was pretty good when targeted 
Um, you know, great tackler too. Like I, I you know, I, I definitely noticed that in the LSU Alabama game, he's, he's someone that can really fly down from the second level. And, you know, we love our multi-sport athletes on here. So just doing some research into his background, average 17 points per game in high school basketball. Um, you know, someone who had a 9.14 RAS score, he was, he was really good at, you know, the broad jump, the 10 yard split, like a lot of the stuff that you want to see from your corner. Um, you know, I think that he, he might be a little bit uh, skinny from, from a peer, like matching up against like the AJ Brown types of receivers. But I think that he can hang with most other receivers in the NFL. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that cross sport kind of profile. Cause obviously Quinion Mitchell, the guy who I did as someone who would, is probably the top cornerback in the draft. Um, I, again, I, I don't think that he would be a player who you would consider with the number one pick in, in most drafts, obviously not this draft. Um, but you look at kind of his profile, obviously he's coming from a different place than Terry and Arnold is, you know, uh, Terry and Arnold, Alabama has that kind of quote pedigree uh, coming from uh, a blue blood type program. Um, Terry and Arnold's coming from Toledo, uh, a, a Mac program. Um, typically what you, you're not going to see a ton of guys, you know, jump way up into the first round from a Mac program. He currently sits at consensus big board number 13. But I think he has all the tools to be successful, and I think it's a, a show that uh, the scouts and, and the league have identified his talent. Um, he's charted out extremely well, one of the best of all time in terms of charting metrics. He also stood out at the Senior Bowl. Um, these are kind of the things you want to see from a, a, a player like this. Um, and, and obviously we'd love to, I didn't do the research like Tej did on his basketball points for game, but hopefully that, you know, maybe it matches up. Maybe we need to do a, something a little closer. Um, but I expect to see a lot of development also from him as he starts facing those, those better players and continuing to grow. And I kind of expect him to have like, be a guy who has a decade plus of dominance and maybe later in his career ends up being a second corner as we've seen, you know, Stefan Gilmore, settle in that role. That's kind of what I'm expecting from him. Maybe not the super high ceiling that someone like a Derek Stingley might have, uh, but expecting him to have a very long NFL career. And I think that's a valuable investment uh, at the professional level. So moving right along into another position, obviously tight end Tej. I think we're both on the same page here about Brock Bowers being kind of the, the power player here in the tight end market. Uh, how high do you think he's going to go? Do you think he's a great investment? What are your thoughts on Brock Bowers? Yeah, so, you know, because of a lot of the moves that the Jets have made this offseason, I think a lot of them have been good at, at making sure they have more versatility at, at what they're going to end up picking. Like, Brock Bowers has been talked about a lot at going number 10 overall, and I could see them taking him. Like, you know, personally, you know, I find it pretty tough to take tight ends in the first round, but, like, you know, it wouldn't be – it would kind of be like a finishing touch on the offense – for them as they're kind of going all in on, on these last two Rogers years here. So you know, I could see him going, going as high as that. And then also going like the, the 10 through 20 range if the jets don't end up taking him, but there's so many reasons to be high on Brock Bowers. I mean, and when you look at all notable tight ends since 2014 football insights, um, you know, put together a really cool graph on this where he has the highest yards per out run of any tight end uh, you know, that was, that was drafted since since 2014 and then he also has the second highest epa per route run just behind isaiah likely so you know he's in the mark andrews kyle pitts tj hawkinson type range when it comes to that those metrics and i think that you know is, is pretty promising for his nfl career yeah as i've spoken uh, uh as i've spoken about you know the last couple of weeks i'm really high on brock bowers as a prospect but we've talked to ben about it we've talked to some other people um, I, I wonder what his value in terms of like the draft construct is. Beat Gamer 99 does a great job of IDing this. He he thinks that uh investing in Bowers over O-line for the Jets, you know, may not be the move to make. And and I, I wouldn't fault him for taking that position. Obviously, uh, when you're looking at tackles in particular. You can save a lot of money and get a lot of surplus value in that first round by going mm -hmm. with a Joe Alt, with an Amarius Mims, um, with some of those great tackle prospects that we're seeing over someone like a Brock Bowers uh, who's playing the tight end position just by pure surplus value. Now, obviously, 
tight ends do have kind of a longer curve. You may save some money uh, by locking him in versus having to go get a tight end uh, in the open market. Um, but, but that being said, I think it's, I think it's probably a better investment early on to go offensive line, though someone like a Brock Bowers may be a better prospect per se. Tash, how do you view kind of in, in terms of this class in particular, the strength of the O-line class, the strength of the wide receiver class, and the strength of obviously Brock Bowers and some of the other tight ends, how would you rank those three in terms of strength this year? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think I'm going to go wide receiver, offensive tackle, tight end. Uh, you know, I, I think tight end would probably be in, in like the second tier and, and wide receiver and offensive tackle are, are pretty tight because there's, it's like it, the, those two positions in particular, wide receiver and offensive tackle are really interesting because there's, there's so many different types and, and uh, you know, kind of like a choose your own adventure with these types of players where it's like you have your elite separators and your speed guys like Malik neighbors um, you know, you have your contested catch guys like Roma Dunze, you know, you, you have your, your slot guys, your, you know, guys that can get, that can work really well outside. Like there's so many different types of wide receivers in that class, in this class that are all going to go, you know, first round high second round. I think that's what makes it really exciting is like, if you, if you want a wide receiver in this draft, like there's really no excuse to walk out of one at, out of the draft without a talented one. And then offensive tackle, I feel pretty similar about where like, if you do need an offensive tackle headed into this draft you should be able to get one at some point in the first round and you should feel pretty good about starting that offensive tackle day one, just because of the talent level at that position as well. Yeah. I have to agree with that ranking. I think you look at the wide receivers uh, and they have the star power at the very top and they have the depth as well. I think wide receiver is probably the position with the most star power outside of the quarterbacks, obviously. And I think they also by far have the most depth. I mean, I think you could have guys like Keon Coleman, Adonai Mitchell, so forth and so on that go day two. And then obviously even farther and deeper into those kind of day three level wide receivers. I think a lot of those guys could end up being real contributors on an NFL team within their first or second year. Um, Beat Gamer 99 had another good point that tight ends can be found later. Most of the times tight ends, don't perform well in their rookie year. That's what the research kind of shows. They have that longer development curve. That being said, the star power is there. Uh, not as deep of a, a class. Uh, I think there's probably three, four guys who are, who are really, really good and really can contribute at least over the first three years, if not farther. But you, you look at the star power with Bowers and you have to say he's right up there with the, with the you know, Marvin Harrison juniors in terms of his profile as a player. And then you look at the tackles. I, I think it's a, it's a notch under the star power, maybe that Brock Bowers may have, or Marvin Harrison Jr. may have. But I think, like you said, that depth and, and the, the number of guys who can fill spots it, it is really good. And I think there's actually a lot of value to, uh, to, to be had probably more in the day two range, but at the guard and center, obviously Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon. I think he's going to be a lock at the next level. Um, I think he's he, he's a, a, ver a very good prospect from the, the terms of his profile. And I think you look across the offensive line very deep this year. Um, so from there, moving on to the defense, uh, this was something that came over, up over the weekend, and me and Tej kind of have differing views um, uh, just to finish off on the tight end, tight end, probably closer to quarterback than any other position where it's situation that is so important. Mm -hmm. Very true. Point. Very true. I mean, you see guys like George Kittle, um, who, who are able to block and, and receive obviously in that Kyle Shannon offense, very important, but there's guys that can kind of get thrown in the wind. Um, and, and we'll see how that kind of changes this year with a Kyle Pitts, obviously moving to a whole new scheme, whole new quarterback. Uh, it'll be very interesting there. Moving on to interior defensive linemen, um, me and Tej kind of have a different view here of who's the best interior defensive lineman in the class. Tej, give us some insight into what you think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know Johnny Newton is your guy, but I really like Byron Murphy out of Texas here, 17th on the consensus big board. You know, he got better every year he was in college, and we know it's pretty tough to play defense in the Big 12, and I think he stepped up and did really well in that role. Last season in particular, he had eight and a half tackles for loss, 
five sacks. And he was even used on offense a couple of times, which is pretty cool. He scored a rushing and a receiving touchdown. So it'll be cool to see if he can still continue that at the next level. But, you know, when you look at his performance at the combine as well, like he's not, he's not someone who's, who's tall or, or big necessarily, but like he has that, that quickness, that explosiveness. He ran a four, eight, eight, 40 yard dash at 297 pounds. Um, you know, for reference, the last time I ran a 40, I ran 499 and I, I weigh, you know, much less than he does. So, you know, Sam, Sam Schwartzstein's in here and he had a really good point about this where it's like, yeah, there's not often that we'll see linemen running 40 yard dashes in the NFL, like a, a, on the actual field, but it just shows you like that they're, that they're in shape, they're in good health and they, they've been caring about, you know, their body throughout this whole process. Like, I think that he's someone that, you know, he just looks very fit and active on the field. And I think that can carry to the next level, uh, you know, when he ends up getting drafted. Yeah. And I don't get me wrong. I think Byron Murphy's a great prospect. And, and I think Tej did a great job of summarizing some of those points. That being said, and, and maybe Tej, this is me dipping into my Mel Kuyper Jr., <laughs> Stephen A. Smith, media Sam rather than analyst Sam. But Johnny Newton is just one of the guys I've absolutely yeah. fell in love with this year. Uh, I've watched a lot of the film for him as well. So this is more ex player Sam probably talking than analyst Sam, though he he is very well regarded by the metrics. Um, but I, I love what Johnny Newton can bring to the game for, for a team. And I, I think he's going to be very usable uh, no matter what team he goes to. And I think that can provide someone a lot of value and, and puts him as the top interior defensive lineman this year. Just a couple of notes I have on him. He can rush from a multitude of spots. I mean, the film has him beating tackles, guards, centers, rushing out of a four eye, rushing out of a three, coming from inside in that A gap in the in, in, at, at a one tech. I mean, I mean, when you have a when you have a guy that can do that, especially at his size, he, he's he weighs a lot. He's a little squatter. He, he's not you know a six four six five guy. But when you get into someone who can do that. It shows so much versatility, and and I just want to give a props to Aaron Donald, obviously retired within the last week. That was something that entailed a lot of people to Aaron Donald is, is kind of that ability to use his hands, get around blocks, and play multiple positions. I'm not necessarily comparing Johnny Newton to Aaron Donald there, but I, I do think that that positional versatility is something that is extremely valuable to teams. Uh, his hand use is what I freak out about. I, I love watching Dexter Lawrence film because of his hand use on an inside rush, particularly when he's lined up in that kind of zero technique over the center. Johnny Newton's hand use is so good, and it, it's almost like a magic trick sometimes. You see the the offensive lineman set backwards, and, and the hands go out, and all of a sudden Johnny Newton's just around him in a split second because he's chopped, dip, ripped those hands down and, and is all of a sudden right behind him making a play in the backfield. So that's kind of my spiel on Johnny Newton. I can talk about it for hours, but when you have someone who can get in the backfield quickly, muck things up for the offense, uh, while also being, you know, a 300 plus pound player, I'm really excited to see him at the next level. Um, so moving into the edge market, uh, similar to the interior defense line, another probably more premium than the interior defensive line. Uh, but this year it, it's an interesting mix. It's kind of a toss up. A lot of people have Dallas Turner going really high, but me and you have separate players that we view as the interior, uh, excuse me, as the, as the top of the edge market. What do you think, Tej? Yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think Dallas Turner is a, a great prospect. Obviously, I think it really comes down to preference of style and, and what you're looking for. And for me, like the edge that I would take versus Liatu Latu at a, at a UCLA. And, you know, I, I look at him and I, I look at his production last year, uh, you know, led the country in tackles for loss per game at 1.8, led the country in sacks per game at 1.08, um, you know, started every game at UCLA his, his two years there. And, like, you just really have to go and watch – the, the game against USC or, or even the game against um, I think it was Oregon state where he, he like can kind of single-handedly affect a lot of these games and, and wreak havoc. And I think that he's the type of guy that is going to be a very high pressure rate guy in the NFL um, where he will be getting in the backfield a lot, causing the quarterback to, to hurry or, or to get off uh, market. So, or, or sorry, off a uh, platform. Like I think that, that a lot of the stuff that he's, he did in college at UCLA on a, on a very good UCLA defense should be able to translate over. And that's why I'm excited for him at the next level. 
Yeah, that's that's super exciting. I really, really thought about this deeply about whether Leitu or someone else would be the top. I really like Leitu as a prospect. I, I think he's really dominant, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him perform best. I, I think this is a tough this is a tough market this year. There's a lot of good players who are very good, and I decided to go with Jared Verse, the Florida State product. He has one of the more interesting paths into the first round in the draft. He played two years at Albany before transferring to Florida State. And, and that being said, I, like I'm not the most confident that he is going to be you know, the tippy top of the class in terms of production, but he's probably someone that I look at the changing landscape of college football and I try to glean an edge potentially somewhere. And, you know, we've seen his talent be ID'd going from high school to uh, the, the college ranks. Obviously, he was not super highly ranked coming out of high school, but came in, went to the FCS level, dominated at the FCS level, moved to the P5 level, dominated the P5 level for two years. Uh, and now NFL scouts kind of expect it to translate to the NFL level. And so as we start seeing the transfer portal open up more guys, uh, have more games in, in, in different situations, different schemes, things like that. I think Jared Verse may be a prospect we look back at and say, hey, this is kind of the new landscape of college football. Let's try to glean as much predictiveness as we can from someone who has dominated in multitudes of different levels and have, has jumped to a completely different talent level from the FCS level to the ACC level. Uh, and really dominated, been on some very good teams. Another thought that I also want to note, just kind of on a grander scale of this draft, is I think this Florida State team that obviously much much maligned, ha having not made the playoffs, uh, obviously a very infamous situation that will probably stick for years to come. But I, 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 we love making these kind of cross-sport comparisons. I, I look at them a lot as that the title winning Villanova teams from years oh. ago in terms of basketball. And the, the reason why I say that is because you look at those Villanova teams in terms of basketball, and now four of those guys are quality starters on NBA teams. And looking back then, you know, they, they seem to be players with kind of strange backgrounds. Had they had been in college for a long time, all of them had near flaws. Most of them went middle, late first round, second round in, in the NBA draft. And it turns out that they just had, you know, a certified all-star, Jalen Brunson. They had uh, Mikael Bridges, who's a starter on a finals team, DiVincenzo. All these guys that just actually turned out to be great talents. And so you look at this Florida State team and, and kind of who the names in the draft are. And you look at Jared Verse, originally went to Albany, made it up to Florida State and dominated. You look at Braden Fisk. Uh, also another transfer that wasn't heralded for several years. And all of a sudden he's at Florida state, he's dominating. He's putting on a show at the combine. Um, you look at Johnny Wilson, six, seven, another transfer, uh, coming in Jaheim bell, undersized tight end. Think he's going to make an impact at the next level. And then even Jordan Travis, the quarterback, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him at least have some impact, whether that's as a backup quarterback or whether he, he jumps to the starter level. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him bring some value to a team at that point. Uh, at, maybe if he gets selected later in the draft as an undrafted free agent. So that's kind of my grander thought on that Florida State team that I kind of wanted to float out there, that this could be something of a bellwether for things to come, of a kind of a hodgepodge of talent coming together and, and dominating college, college football, still being undervalued, and then a lot of those players going on to compete at the NFL level. So that's, that's a great analogy, honestly. Like, I mean, you, you look at Florida State last year and, and you talk about Jared Verse um, and, and especially that, that Louisville ACC championship game where they're on their third quarterback of the season and they, they end up winning that game because their defensive line played one of the best games you'll ever see from a defensive line. I, you know, I think verse and, and Fisk and like the talent they had there is a big part of that. And then you, yeah, you're right. Like you look at the other side of the ball as well. And like Mike Norvell's ability to use the transfer portal to bring all this talent together. Um, you know, Keon Coleman was someone who, who looked really good at Michigan state, but didn't necessarily have a quarterback, you know, Norvell offered him that opportunity. And now he's going to be a receiver. That's going to be taken in the first round here. It's like, yeah, like you can see how the, the transfer portal can affect the, these draft stocks over time. Whereas if, if Coleman stayed at Michigan state and, you know, maybe still didn't get good, good quarterback play, like 
he, he might be getting taken in the second round. Like the production wouldn't have been there. The highlight reel wouldn't have been there. So it's, it's, it's cool to see how that can affect someone's draft capital. Yeah, it, I think it's extremely exciting and it will be interesting to see how, you know, the transfer market moves forward, whether that provides more predictiveness or, or whether it, it's just maybe it adds noise. We don't know. It's a new thing. Um, Tage, what are your thoughts on maybe you, you see a guy jump around, you see a guy succeed. Obviously, Jaden Daniels, a guy that we both really like, uh, transferred, didn't have a ton of success at Arizona State, ended up bouncing to LSU and, and becoming the Heisman. Do you think that something like that shows shows you something about the NFL or you think it may just add noise? No, that's a good question to bring up. I, you know, my, my original prior on this, like a couple of years ago, before the explosion of the transfer portal was that if someone was transferring and especially if it was from, you know, a, a high end, like blue chip type school to maybe like a middle of the pack one, like that was a little bit of a, a yellow flag on their, their profile. Um, you know, because of like, maybe they just weren't able to compete at that new school. But now that I've, I've seen more examples of this over time, you know, I've, I've evolved that opinion where I think if you transfer and you're productive in two different schools, two different environments, that's a really good indictment on what you could be at the next level, because we think about separating players from situation all the time. And the transfer portal gives us that, you know, kind of like alternate look into what would happen if that player uh, you know, move spots. Like I think I was talking to, uh, you know, a friend at a team about Bo Nix and we were saying like, you know, Bo Nix, his stats, like his sack rate and his time to throw and his completion percentage and like all that stuff, like look good across the board, but we only saw Bo Nix play well at Oregon. We didn't see him play that well at Auburn. So like how much weight are you putting into those two different environments. And I think like when you see a player play well at both environments, like that is, is pretty promising for the next level. Yeah. And, and you, you brought it to the quarterback position. I, I think that's great because you look across this quarterback class and, you know, most of them have transferred. You, Caleb Williams showed some pretty early success yeah. at Oklahoma, won the Heisman at USC. Jaden Daniels, not as successful at Arizona state, won the Heisman at LSU. Bo Nix, uh, obviously made some plays at Auburn, not as successful, moves on to all Oregon, very, very successful. Uh, Michael Penix Jr., someone who was on an Indiana team, and they said he was carrying the team on his back. I yeah. consider that a success. Then blows it out of the park at the at, at Washington, making the national championship this year. Uh, another great comment um, in the chat, Will on, on Twitter says, Adonai Mitchell coming from Georgia to Texas. Uh, that, that's another one of someone who, you know, we, we may have not seen it a ton at Georgia, very successful at Texas. Uh, Tej brought up a good point about trying to contextualize and contextualize change and the change that may happen going to the NFL. I think this is definitely something to watch in the next couple years. So thank you for joining us. We're going to move into our class play picks. Obviously, we every week we pick some of our favorite draft picks. We've done running back. D-line, wide receiver, Tej, your running backs are uh, Christian McCaffrey and DeAnthony Thomas, D-lineman and Dominican Sue, wide receiver Tavon Austin and Justin Blackman. This week we're doing cornerbacks. Who's one of your favorite cornerback draftees of all time? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 I like both of our teams so far. Um, you know, so we're going to try to add to that and, and put together this, this super team here. I'm going to go with Denzel Ward, um, you know, as, as a prospect. I loved him when he was in college. You know, I thought that he he did a great job at Ohio State. Like again, like you talk about someone who's who's versatile, able to play both positions. Um, you know, there's some stat about him where he went between Ohio State and and the NFL. He went five straight years without allowing uh, you know, over 70 yards of of receiving in a single game. Which I think about like the passing environments that these corners live in right now. Like that's that's very impressive. And so, you know, he's someone that that I think has, has done well at the next level, you know, got a very deserving extension from the Browns and, and was someone coming out of college that, you know, I was, I was all over and and you know thought deserved to go very highly in the draft. Yeah, Denzel Ward's great pick there. Um, I'm actually going to pick someone who was drafted as a corner and ended up not playing corner. I, I don't know if that's cheating. I guess it's my own game here, so I'm going to call it as not cheating. Uh, but I picked Malcolm Jenkins, and the reason I picked Malcolm Jenkins is because he comes in as a corner, 
and then moves to safety, obviously, in his later years, in his earlier years with New Orleans, then going into Philly. And I know I may be playing, you know, New Orleans, Louisiana bias here, but I really love those years in Philly where he kind of turned into kind of a new wave type safety as the league evolved kind of from the beginning of his career in 2009 into the mid 2010s, uh, where safeties had to basically be able to cover. They had to be able to tackle. He played a little bit of high safety, moved into a strong safety role later in his career where he was basically a mix of, you know, a cover linebacker, a nickelback. Uh, he, he he played so much, many positions over the course of his career, and I, I think he's just a great pick. Uh, obviously, for New Orleans, where he you know was an an AP uh, player, second team, um, couple Pro Bowls, a lot of good seasons, Super Bowl, uh, etc. So my pick is Malcolm Jenkins to add to my team of Reggie Bush, Al Woods, Barkevius Mingo, Des Bryant, and Michael Crabtree. So, Tej, any last words on your thoughts on this consensus big board, on, on the best players before we move into quarterbacks in the following weeks? I, I do love your Malcolm Jenkins pick. I mean, you're right. Like, it's, it's cool that we saw him play so many different positions throughout his career where he started at, at corner his, his rookie year, moved to, to free safety, you know, experimented with strong safety a little bit before, like, closing his career on that. Like, you, you know, to, to see a, a career last 13 years – um, you know, like his did and like for him to be able to handle all those positions. Like, I think it's, it's really interesting. And like, you know, I think someone like Cooper DeGene has been talked about as someone who could maybe make the switch from corner to safety. So I hope that he is able to kind of look at Malcolm Jenkins and, and what he did and, you know, make that decision with his coaching staff when it comes to that. Yeah, that's, that's a great thought. Cooper DeGene was someone that I gave a close eye to when we were talking about cornerbacks ended up going with uh, Quinion Mitchell, but I, I think he's someone who could definitely fit in that mold and a very interesting prospect round one, round two. Uh, and so Tej, thank you for joining me, man. Exciting to talk about this uh, consensus big board players outside of quarterbacks. Obviously in the next couple of weeks, guys, we're going to be focusing in on quarterbacks. We love all the questions. We love the participation. Feel free to hit me on Twitter at Brookhouse Sports. Tej, you want to plug your Twitter and anything else you'll be working on? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at TEJFB Analytics. And then, yeah, just keep listening to the class play and, and some of the other Sumer podcasts that we have. Yep. Thank you, everyone. And from Tej Seth and from Sam Brookhouse, thank you very much and have a great one.